Imagine the scene, a splendid palace in Paris, an estate banquet in honor of the King of Siam. Napoleon III is there, top government ministers, noblemen, leading social figures. The meal is a seven-course feast, splendid food on gold and silver serving plates, the finest bone china crockery, and the latest sensation, cutlery made from that most precious of new metals, aluminium. Wait a minute, aluminium a precious metal? Isn't it the most common metal in the Earth's crust? Well, yes it is, but in 19th century France, in fact in the rest of the world too, it was considered as rare and valued as gold. Why? The answer is because it was difficult, dangerous and expensive to extract aluminium from its ores. In 1855, the French chemist Henri Sinclair de Vie had a novel idea. Why not mix an aluminium compound with an even more reactive metal and see what happens? The more reactive metal he used was sodium and the reaction was alarming. De Vie had to construct a special furnace out of brick to house the reaction. The method certainly worked. Aluminium was produced, but in small quantities only, and it was costly. So why didn't they use this method? Smelting with coke, as in iron making, was the most widely used method of extracting a metal from an ore. It was cheap, efficient, and used tried and tested techniques. Why couldn't De Vee and his contemporaries do that? This huge industrial complex is British Steel at Redcar in the northeast of England. It houses the biggest blast furnace in Europe. The complex has its own dock because iron ore is imported here from North and South America and Australia. There is now virtually no iron ore mined in this country. Iron ore is a mixture of chemicals, mainly iron 3 oxide with all sorts of other rocky materials. The iron 3 oxide is simply iron and oxygen combined together. To get at the iron, the oxygen has to be removed. When a compound loses oxygen, it's said to be reduced. Simply heating the iron ore does not work, so a reducing agent has to be used, and in the blast furnace, it's carbon in the form of coke. The iron ore is crushed, mixed with coke, and heated to form an iron-rich clinker called sinter. The sinter forms the basis of the charge, which is fed into the top of the giant blast furnace. More coke is added and also limestone. The sinter and coke have to be strong enough to support the weight of the charge in the furnace. So our ingredients so far are iron ore, or iron 3 oxide, with a chemical formula of Fe2O3, and the reducing agent coke, or carbon, symbol C, which is also the fuel. What's missing now? the blast that gives the furnace its name. It's a blast of hot air which contains oxygen. The carbon burns in the oxygen to form carbon dioxide and a great deal of heat is produced. The temperature at the bottom of the furnace is around 2000 degrees Celsius. The reduction of the iron oxide happens in two stages. At very high temperatures, carbon is a very efficient reducing agent. It's more reactive than the iron. The two compete for the available oxygen and the carbon wins. Carbon and oxygen come together to form carbon dioxide and molten iron is formed. The carbon dioxide then reacts with more coke to form carbon monoxide. Both of those reactions are endothermic. They lower the temperature and that triggers a second reduction of the iron 3 oxide. Below about 700 degrees Celsius, carbon monoxide becomes the better reducing agent. 
there's another competition for oxygen and again the iron 3 oxide loses out. A spongy iron is produced which melts as it descends through the furnace where the temperature is higher. Iron is tapped off in a continuous red hot stream. Another product of the process is slag. This is formed by the limestone which was part of the original charge reacting with impurities such as silica in the molten mixture. The slag floats on the surface of the liquid iron and is channeled away to a big pit where it's sprayed with water to rapidly cool. The slag is used in road making and building. This process of smelting has been used for centuries to produce iron cheaply and on a large scale, but it wouldn't work for aluminium. The temperatures needed to make the aluminium ore molten would be so high the furnace would be destroyed. Back in the 19th century, Henri Saint Clair de Ville opened the way for an aluminium industry on a small scale with his process of using a more reactive metal, but the costs of the process were too high. What else could they try? The latest sensation in the scientific world then was electricity. Everyone was talking about it. They were curious to discover its powers. The British scientist Humphrey Davy tried applying it to liquids to see what effect it would have. This was known as electrolysis, passing a current through a liquid causing it to separate into different substances. Davy discovered six new metals in this way, but aluminium was not one of them. The difficulty was that aluminium ore could not be melted to make it liquid. Then, towards the end of the century, a solvent was found that would dissolve the ore. It was called cryolite. When heated, cryolite would melt and would then dissolve the aluminium oxide. That solution could be electrolyzed. In industry, aluminium smelting requires a huge power supply. This is British Alcan's aluminium smelting plant in Northumbria, and it has its own power station nearby. The part of the plant where electrolysis is carried out is called the pot room. There are 176 cells in this room, producing 190 tonnes of aluminium a day. The electrolytic cell has to be lined with carbon. In industry, graphite is used. The base of the cell, shaped like a huge bath, is the cathode. The anode takes the form of a series of carbon blocks dipped into the cell. The solution is cryolite, with aluminium oxide dissolved in it. Under these conditions, the particles of both elements have an electrical charge, so they're called ions. The aluminium is positive, the oxygen negative. Chemical reactions only occur at the electrodes. When current passes through the solution, the oxygen ions are attracted to the anode. The aluminium ions move to the cathode. As the aluminium ions lose their positive charge, they become atoms of pure aluminium. The electric current involved in the process is very large, 150,000 amps. The heating effect of that helps to keep the solution molten at around 1,000 degrees Celsius. At the anode, another chemical reaction is taking place. Carbon combines with oxygen being released by electrolysis to form carbon dioxide. This means the anode is constantly being eaten away. The gap between the anode and cathode has to be right for the most efficient operation of the cell. This man is checking the levels and will make adjustments if necessary. Eventually the corrosion of the anode is so severe that this is all that's left of it after a month, so it has to be replaced. The powdery crust on top of the cell is aluminium oxide. It's put there for two reasons. One, 
to act as an insulating blanket to keep heat in. Two, it helps to absorb other gases like fluorine, which are given off in the reactions. The aluminium produced as a liquid at the cathode is 99.8% pure. It's siphoned off at regular intervals. The molten metal produced contains some impurities, which form as a scum on the surface. This can be scraped off. The ladles of molten aluminium are transported to another section of the plant so that casting can take place. The metal is held in this furnace at a temperature of around 700 degrees Celsius. Aluminium and iron are extracted from their ores in very different ways, but they do have something in common. They both need other substances to be added to make them commercially usable. They need to be made into alloys. This is titanium which is added to the aluminium while it's molten. The hot aluminium flows down a channel. Being so reactive, the aluminium at the surface of the stream immediately reacts with air to form a fine film of aluminium oxide. Samples are taken and cast into moulds to be sent to the laboratory at the plant for quality analysis. The molten aluminium is poured into big moulds, which are cooled by water. The outer surfaces freeze and the slab of aluminium alloy is lifted slowly out of the floor. This huge slab is the light, strong, brightly coloured metal that we use for so many things. Remember though, it is an alloy. Let's see how we make iron into an alloy because it's a lot more complicated and more spectacular. The starting point for steel is iron fresh from the blast furnace. The molten metal is poured into huge containers called torpedoes. They're used to transport the iron to the nearby steelworks. At this stage, the iron is only about 94% pure, and there's still quite a lot of carbon in it, which makes it brittle. Some of the carbon and other impurities, including sulfur, phosphorus, and silicon, have to be removed. Sulfur is a non-metal. When magnesium powder is blown into the molten iron, it combines with the sulfur to form magnesium sulfide. The other impurities are also non-metals, but they'll burn with oxygen to form oxides which are acidic. So a short oxygen blast is used. Then quicklime, a base, is added. This reacts with the acidic oxides to form scum, which is scraped off.
This huge ladle, which contains 230 tons of metal at a temperature of more than 1,000 degrees Celsius, is lifted to another section of the plant. This is scrap iron and steel, which is being recycled. It's the first thing to go into the converter, the vessel where iron is converted into steel. Next, the purified molten iron is poured in. The scrap melts in the intense heat. The converter is enormous. It holds 350 tons. The next step is to blast in high purity oxygen. Once again, the sparks fly. The oxygen combines with carbon and any remaining unwanted elements to eliminate them from the steel. The carbon leaves the converter as a gas, carbon monoxide, which is burnt off. The carbon content of the steel by now is down to around 0.4%. It's time to throw in some other things, various chemicals known as fluxes. They ensure the steel has the right composition. At this plant, steel is rolled out into slabs. The outer shell has solidified, but the inside is still molten. It's cut to length with powerful gas cutters. The slabs are stacked ready for transportation to other plants to be made into beams, columns and plates. As we've seen, iron and aluminium are extracted in very different ways. But there's one more thing they have in common. There is only a finite amount of them still to be taken from the Earth's crust. One way of tackling future shortages is to recycle. As we've seen, steel is now reclaimed and put back into the steel making process. Aluminium cans are another prime target for recycling, if only because there are so many of them around 4,000 million in circulation in Britain every year. There are many advantages to recycling. For a start, there's a lot less metal rubbish lying around the landscape. Raw materials aren't used up as quickly. Less energy is needed to change old metal to new. In so many ways, recycling preserves precious resources.